quickly ITC lunch. We just heard an excellent uh, presentation by Gillian sitting over there, and she will tell us uh, some more. We asked her too many questions, so she has too many projects now for next uh, summer, I guess. Right. Uh, um, we'll start with uh, Laura uh, Mayorga uh, from here at the CFA. Uh, she, uh, she will talk about the icy terrestrial exoplanets in our backyard. And then uh, we'll continue with Kathy uh, Olkin from uh, Boulder. Uh, she will speak about NASA's uh, Lucy mission, serving the diversity of the Trojans. And then we'll hear from uh, Jillian, Jillian uh, on migrating black holes in AGN disks as gravitational wave sources. And uh, just to demonstrate that we also allow the men to speak, uh, we'll have uh, uh, Rudy Montez from the CFA talking about the bridge programs in the US. Laura. Okay. Is that working? Awesome. Uh, so, as Avi said, my name is Laura Mirga and I'm a Harvard Future Faculty Leaders Fellow here at CFA. And what I would like to talk about today is how it is necessary and possible to leverage solar system data sets to refine our characterization methods for exoplanets and reflected light, and in particular, icy terrestrial exoplanets. Now, one such way we have measured reflection is with an orbital phase curve, this diagram shown here on the left, which requires us to understand how a planet's scattering changes as a function of its phase angle, or essentially illumination here. This has been so far limited to the largest, closest in planets, for example, hot Jupiters, and in the future, observatories with chronographic uh, capabilities like Louvoir, which is a sample image shown here, or HabEx will be able to detect light from an exoplanet directly. These planets will be colder, not tidally locked, um, and you can see that even some, the potential for smaller planets like Earth and Venus uh, can be detected with such facilities. But you won't have phase angle information from a single snapshot like this image here. Uh, for my thesis work with Jupiter, I showed that Jupiter changes color as a function of illumination angle. It is darker near quarter phases uh, than expected by simple analytic models. And from hemispheric observations, you can extract the rotation period thanks to the presence of Jupiter's great red spot. Therefore, it is essential that we make similar observations to the geometries we expect from direct imaging missions of resolved objects where we have a decent idea of what the answers actually are as a training ground and benchmark for these kinds of future observations. So a lot of effort has already been made to understand exo-Earths um, in particular, and this was aided by NASA's epoxy spacecraft, a bunch of little movies showing on the left, um, where it made an observation of the Earth and caught the moon transiting the Earths, and you're about to see it go by. And so here is some recent work on the right using that data to study Earth as an exoplanet and looking into surface and cloud variations. So you see here Earth as it progresses from being in full phase, fully illuminated, and then all the way down to a crescent phase. So this is a simulated image sequence of Earth going through phases. But for colder planets, what can we use? What are the icy terrestrial exoplanets in our own solar system? The Galilean satellites. So here are just some basic figures about each of the moons. They're actually a pretty decent analog to the TRAPPIST-1 system. Uh, as far as potential surface features, uh, maybe these are a bit more icy than the actual TRAPPIST planets are a little more rocky. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not arguing for the case of exomoons, okay? Just to be clear. What I'm arguing here is that what we do know about the Galilean moons, is despite how similar they are in size and density, temperature to each other, they have had radically different evolution histories. They have different interiors. You know, some, have, uh, some are volcanically active. Some have, it's just an old crater process. Um, there's a global magnetic field around Ganymede. They're radically different, varied interiors, surfaces, and are an example of possible surfaces that we could find on terrestrial exoplanets. Okay? So we have our targets, and now we need our data. So the data we're using is coming from the Cassini spacecraft, which did a flyby of Jupiter in about late 2000, 2001. And sadly, it is no longer with us. A moment of silence. Uh, so with an instrument called the Imaging Science Subsystem, the ISS, it took tens of thousands of images of Jupiter during this flyby period. And it just so happened that the moons were occasionally targeted during this flyby, but actually occur in the background in the field of view of the cameras that were targeting Jupiter at the time. 
And so the ISS had two cameras. There was the narrow angle camera, the NAC, or the wide angle camera, the WAC. And so this is an example of some diagnostics for my uh, reduction, or not my reduction, my anal analysis pipeline. And so you see the whole image here on the left. And I have circled the positions of the moons as indicated to me by the spice information, the navigation information of where we thought the CD was, where we thought the moons were at this particular point in time. And then on the right here, we have the zoom-ins of those locations of the actual moons. Uh, so typically, in the NAC, the moons are resolved. Um, and so I use a circle-finding algorithm to actually refine their positions um, and determine uh, basically the appropriate aperture um, for these, the different moons. And the majority of the images during the flyby were taken in six filters. And this little inset here is just in case you were curious about the six filters. But each camera actually had a different set of 18 to 24 filters, but a lot of them were in common. And so these are six where it happened to be most often uh, taking images of uh, the moons. And then here's the WAC image, sample image. And so you can see the same thing on the left, uh, the entire image. And then the moon locations are highlighted in the little circles. And then our little uh, postage stamp images here. Typically in the WAC, the images of the moons are, un the moons are unresolved. Um, and so uh, given the spice information, I know just about how far away they are. We know how big they are. I know what illumination phase angle they're at. I know what. So the subspacecraft longitude of the moon is, okay? And so I can compute their effectivity for each of the moons given this particular viewing geometry, okay? So this produces a light curve. So basically what I'm showing here across the top is, in this case, IO, uh, the reflectivity as a function of what I'm calling here is orbital phase. But since the moon are tidally locked, what we're actually seeing is one single rotation. So I've confined this to just a few phase angles between like 14 and 25 degrees, okay? So this is just outside of the range of what is possible to view from the ground. We only see about 12, okay? So since I know the longitude of the moon I'm looking at and the phase along I'm observing the moons, I can separate these two effects, right? So this is why uh, I've color-coded these to be the actual longitude of the moon and not its orbital phase as it goes around, right? So the phase angle is determined by Cassini's motion here, um, not like its illumination based on Jupiter, right? It's not a true analog here to an exoplanet system. Um, so this, we have violet, green, red. Uh, this is basically some, a little deeper into the red, a little deeper even further, um, since these were filters used for targeting Saturn's particular uh, wavelengths. And then across the top I said is Io, and across the bottom here we have Ganymede in the same thing. This last panel is just, I, I bend all the points. You can see the black points on each of these filter figures. And I subtracted the means out so you can see how they're varying compared to each other. And so IOs here, you can see that there's definitely some sort of chromatic variation here, whereas Ganymede seems pretty consistent with rotation. Okay. So we can invert these phase curves and get brightness maps for the moons. And so here are just three of those filters, bio green, or violet, green, and red. And I just use a simple orange size model to do this inversion. And the resulting fit to this curve is this red line here. And this is the resulting brightness map you get from that. So this is just using uh, four slices. Um, and I've sort of just like smeared them out a little bit. So because there's no true like real slice division in real life, right, of what the moons actually look like. Uh, and these black points are still the same bin data points from the previous figure. So I'm showing this in a cutesy little mole-wide projection, so it kind of looks more planety. But we can compare this to the USGS astrogeology mosaics that were created using the Galileo and Voyager imaging data set of the different moons. And so that's what's shown down here in this grayscale for IO. <laughs> so I can take that and do sort of a similar thing. I just slice it up into the same four slices and did a similar projection here. Now, most of these images are actually clear filter, and then where they didn't have quite the coverage, they supplemented some other filters. They're also at a bunch of random different illumination angles, and they just sort of like made them all match up at the seams. So this isn't a true comparison, okay? So really, this map here that we're trying to match up is some sort of linear combination of these three effects, and then some other things that we're not quite fully accounting for, okay? And so I've plotted here on the lower right just these, uh, the slice brightness. This is normalized. Um, and some linear combination of the three um, as a function of longitude. And so you can see that, you know, this isn't like the worst thing you've ever seen. Uh, what's promising is, you know, the peak is kind of where the peak should be. And most importantly, the, the darkest region here is exactly where we expect it to be. So it's the same place. And so you can tell, 
we noticed earlier, right, there's this color variation on Io, and this has actually been postulated to be varying amounts of sulfur compounds across the surface. And so this is sort of promising that you can actually figure out something about the compositional variations across the moon just from unresolved hemispherically averaged data. And so this distinct color variation with surface rotation is something that could be detected by a future mission. So same thing from Ganymede, uh, before I run out of time. Uh, it's much more consistent with respect to variations in color. You can see all the maps look just about the same, and then we have the same thing across the bottom. Uh, again, hey look, the max is in the same spot, and the min is also in the same spot, which is promising given this is, you know, violet and not blue, so it's not really clear, but we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, additionally, though, the brightness variation for Ganymede is actually a lot larger, like min-max differences in this than it was for Io. And so the rotational brightness can be significant even before we start considering like adding a thin atmosphere or big fluffy white clouds that it could also vary on top of something like this. And so just some takeaways here at the end. Uh, the variability of Io and Ganymede shows that reflectivity can vary by 10 to 35 percent. Okay, This is non-negligible depending on the observed wavelength. And these are pretty wide filters that we were looking in, right? So you could Presumably, do spectroscopy, you know, get some narrower filters, and really pick out compositional differences here. And for these reflected light direct imaging missions of the future, such as HebEx and Louvoir, we will have to take into account these rotational variations in addition to these illumination variations that can happen in, uh, in an observation like that. And lastly, hemispherically averaged data from these future direct imaging missions can be used to determine rotation periods. What I didn't show you was that the in the... Uh, if you do like a periodogram of the light curve, you can very clearly pick out the rotation of each of the moons, infer surface compositions, and create these brightness maps. Thank you. So Laura, um, with the JWST, will it be possible to take a spectrum of the reflected light curve in the sense of probing the composition of the atmosphere that exists? Yeah, so JWST, uh, the issue with JWST actually is that it's very much in the infrared. I think for NERIS, the short end, it only goes up to like 0.6 microns, about 600 is definitely in the red. And since these are pretty cold objects, it's definitely possible that will be reflected light, but I, I would be much more concerned about thermal emission in such a scenario. Charles. So Neo has this very active surface uh, volcanism. Have you tested the time variations in any of these qualities during the uh, period that you have lots of data? I have not tested it because I'm bending sort of a bunch of different phase angles over this. Uh, you can, I haven't separated out the illumination variations in this short period of time, but it is definitely possible because we know that Galileo soft blooms, for example, that there should be some sort of temporal variation on top of this. What's that? That was my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks for a nice talk. So is there any reason why you're selecting all, only these, let's say, limited amount of slices for your reconstruction? Because some of your light curve seems to have more structure, and, and it seems to me that uh, you're not giving enough uh, degrees of freedom for yeah. your reconstruction. Yeah, so you would think that. Um, so up on the upper left, I have a little point here that's sort of indicating like the standard deviations of all the points that I factored in. And so the numbers is you know, not insignificant compared to the actual values here. Um, so a lot of that I actually think is noise. And what I did do is I did try doing a variable number of slices, computing chi-square, and basically seeing at what point do I reach like where I stop gaining too much by adding more slices here because I don't want to over it. Right? And so that's what motivated Six slices in this okay. scenario, four. Oh. Any other, Gary? Uh, unlike the, the test cases you use, uh, uh, which do not have moons orbiting them, most of the planets in our solar system do have moons. Now, in most cases, they're small and I imagine insignificant when you try to do direct imaging. But would a system analogous to the Earth moon system, our, our moon is unusually large relative to the size of the Earth. Would that perturb the results, the analysis you're doing, or does the room you move remain small enough that it's a very small negligible effect? So what I'm arguing here is not necessarily that this is like an example of an exomoon. I'm really focused on like the surface geology that a potential icy terrestrial work could have. But to answer your question, um, there has been work shown, for example, that 
if you look at uh, the transit timing or, or if you do like a direct imaging observation of like an Earth moon-ish system, uh, the color of the moon is different than the color of the planet. And you can detect a moon's presence, for example, by looking at sort of the, the centroiding offset when you do that image in different wavelengths. Because in some cases, the moon will be brighter and the centroid will be shifted more towards the position of the moon, and then in some cases, it will be darker and it will shift more towards the moon. Um, but yeah, definitely, exomoons are real exomoons. <laughs> not what I'm talking about here. Are a very interesting prospect and would, would definitely like contaminate uh, a, a, your observation of the next planet. Um, with my Jupiter data, for example, you could actually, I didn't, I purposely did not try to account for when any of these moons cross in front of Jupiter or left a shadow on Jupiter. And you can actually see it in some of the data that there's this big shadow from Io. I purposely did not include that because those are very real effects that we won't necessarily be able to pick out. So far, there is one uh, candidate for a moon, but it's still disputed. So. Say and nothing. So. <laughs> <laughs> From your work, do you see any effect at all of the supposed ocean in, under the surface of Europa? I think most of the evidence for the oceans underneath Europa, and I think also. I think one of the other ones also has a subsurface ocean. It is comes from the gravity measurements, yes, I but I don't so see anything. I don't see anything in the reflective light. It was just too deep, right? I'm very, I'm very much seeing light that just is bouncing up and scattering off the surface. Yeah. There are some plumes, but they occupy a very small fraction of the area. It doesn't yeah. plumes come to like phases. Yeah. I would worry that that'd be within my error bars. And I yes, exactly. Again. Well, let's thank uh, Laura again. And I should mention that Kathy is uh, giving the CFA login later today at the forum. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to talk to you about the Lucy mission. This is a Discovery class mission uh, recently selected by NASA. And it's called Lucy. We named it after the Australopithecus fossil that you see up in the corner there. This is a hominid fossil that transformed our understanding of human evolution. And we're interested in studying the diversity of the Trojans to inform our understanding of solar system evolution. So it's a tour, uh, a Trojan tour, and we are going to uh, the Trojan asteroids, which are located at the L4 and L5 uh, location around Jupiter. And so this is to orient you where we are. And we plan on launching in October of 2021, and we have a backup launch date of uh, 2022. In addition, we will be flying past a main belt asteroid uh, as a rehearsal in 2025. And then we have five Trojan encounters. We're encountering four objects in the L4 swarm and uh, two objects in the L5 swarm so that we, as part of our sampling the diversity of the Trojans. And uh, to motivate why we want to do this, um, Trojan asteroids are not a diver they are not a homogeneous population. They show diversity in color um, and so and spectral type. So you can see at the top using the DeMeo et al. classification, there's uh, C's, P's, and D type asteroids in this, these locations, and it's predominantly C's or it's predominantly D's and P's, which is with a small number of C asteroids. And they show a range of albedos from about 4 to 15 percent. You see uh, in the corner there that's visible in albedo versus the, the WISE uh, W1 filter, which I believe is like 3 microns albedo. And we see a range of colors. And the range of colors is seen in both uh, swarms of the objects. So you can see this is from Josh Emery. 
and you can see different color populations and uh, with the Lucy mission, we intend to study the diversity. We're going to see different colors, different spectral types, uh, different sizes. And part of the reason we wanted to do that is because uh, small bodies in particular are kind of the, the leftover remnants from solar system formation, and they have been scattered about and acted upon by the giant planets. Some like the cold classical Kuiper Belt objects that I'll be talking to you about later today, I haven't been dynamically influenced by the giant planets, but then others, like the Trojan asteroids, have been. And so uh, we believe that these uh, objects, one theory is that these objects uh, would have formed out in the outer solar system at a range of heliocentric distances, and they would have different color and composition do, having formed at different ranges. And then giant planet migration would cause those objects to become trapped uh, uh, in the L4 and L5 swarms. So this is just a cartoon. Yes. Woo. <laughs> so very cartoonish animation. But what I'm talking about here are things like the Nice model, um, where there's actual <laughs> math behind it, not just a cartoon. Um, so these processes uh, are one way to explain how these objects got trapped. Um, and that's why we want to go see them. We want to really understand their diversity. This is enabled by um, uh, a very uh, unique opportunity found by our mission design team to get to all six of these targets. We started looking at um, a C and a D type target. You, you can see the trajectory is the red line. I'll just let it keep going as I'm explaining. And we uh, wanted to go by uh, two objects that were near equal size and different spectral types. That is our main belt asteroid that we just flew by. And now you can see the spacecraft is going out into the uh, L4 swarm. Those are our four targets indicated in white. And starting in 2027, you can see there, uh, we fly past uh, Eurybates, Palomele, and then there's a little bit of time, and we fly past uh, Lucas, and then Oris is the last one in the L4 swarm. I'll tell you more about these targets in a minute. Then the spacecraft flies back, and we're going to uh, go and do another Earth flyby and um, come back out and, uh, and uh, encounter Patroclus and Menetius, which are in the L5 swarm. Patroclus and Menetius are, is a binary pair, which is why you only see one dot there. And so uh, we get out to Patroclus and Menetius in 2033. <laughs> so you have to be very patient to explore the outer solar system. So we were really excited to be able to find a trajectory that went to all these different targets. Um, and this is an idea of what our targets look like. Now, uh, this is uh, an artist's rendition. Um, right there, artist concept. So we have light curves, which give us um, a rough idea of the axis ratios of these bodies. Um, but any of the surface detail is, is fictional, right? We don't know what the surfaces look like. And um, so we started by looking at wanting to compare Eurybates and Oris, because they're uh, similar sizes, similar orbits, but uh, different uh, spectral types. And so uh, when we asked the mission designers to try and find trajectories, that's what we started with. And then we kept adding on from there. I'll tell you a little bit about your um, This uh, is This target is interesting in and of itself, even beyond uh, the other things I've said, because it's the largest remnant of a disrupted collisional family in the Trojans. So there's only one um, family known in the Trojans, and Euripides is the largest one of all of them. And we've never, fin we've never visited a collisional uh, family member before. And so this is going to be very interesting, and it's going to tell us a bit about collisional properties. 
And this also might be um, some indication of why it's a C-type and why there's very few C-types. So one idea is that perhaps uh, a C-type is what you get when you crack open a D-type. So basically you have a collision and you, um, oh, let me go back to that. Uh, you have a collision and then you reveal a fresh surface, the interior. So uh, that's one of the things that we'll be investigating by comparing these different objects. And then uh, I'm also want to tell you about uh, Patroclus and Menetius. These are uh, two of our targets. These are some of the largest uh, Trojan asteroids, and this is a binary pair. So um, this is an artist's conception down here in the bottom, but it's to scale uh, with the objects and their relative distances that they uh, orbit each other. And then at the top there, you see a Keck AO observation of them. And so this is basically the best image we have of them to date. So being able to fly by, we're going to learn a lot more uh, by looking, being able to look at the compositional detail at higher spatial resolution and also look at geology. So these objects are um, about 100 kilometers across. Um, and we have good size estimates from stellar occultations. Um, there's also been mutual event observations of these objects. Um, so the thing that's very interesting is because with this binary pair um, to transport that to the L5 system, how can you manage to have this collisional process and then maintain your, your binary system? So we want to look and see and understand this system because we know that there's a large number of binaries in the Kuiper Belt. There's a, a large population, and so if they came from the Kuiper Belt, okay, that might make sense, but then in that transport process, you would expect that they would have been stripped apart from each other. And so this is um, a target that's of interest to really understand, were they a part of this population that's very primordial? And so uh, looking at our targets a different way, um, we get a large a difference in mass. And right here, we're assuming the same density because we don't know what the density is. But we will be measuring the mass as we fly by. And we'll be making shape observations that we can use to derive shape so that we can get a density. And I will, I am two slides. So this is our, uh, our instrument suite. We have uh, three instruments, which are the LORI instrument, RALPH, and TESS. And then we have two other systems that we use for uh, scientific investigation, the radio science subsystem that we'll measure the Doppler shift with, and our terminal tracking camera we'll also use for science. And with that, I will open up to questions. Given that the orbit goes back and forth between objects of interest and the Earth, uh, did you contemplate the possibility of scooping something and bringing it back? <laughs> we did. We did. In fact, it'd be great to do that. And, and you know, of course, uh, Osiris Rex, uh, with their uh, sampling system, made that very interesting to think about. But the fact of the matter is, you just really can't do that in a discovery class budget. And so, it's too expensive. yeah, yeah, it's, it, it, we need to do what we can do and then have follow-ons. So uh, I'll leave that for the, the next mission. So how long will you in fact get in each, uh, at each asteroid? Yeah, so these are flybys. Right. So we're going to be flying by. It's, it's kind of the initial reconnaissance idea of solar system exploration. And um, our velocities are slower than the New Horizons velocities. New Horizons flies by about 14 kilometers per second, so it's super fast. Uh, our velocities are about 8 kilometers per second. Our targets, though, are smaller than Pluto. Um, some are about the same size as uh, MU69, which you'll hear about later today. Um, but we'll get resolutions uh, down to 14 meters per pixel. And we'll be getting stereo and uh, <coughs> compositional information, infrared spectra from uh, 1 to 3.6 microns. You can resolve big vehicles, but you can't resolve big 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the beginning, you showed a division among the uh, objects by size. Yeah. You didn't indicate the numbers that were in each size. But I did notice very strangely that the P types, which are roughly half of the smallest and largest sizes, have zero representation in the middle size range. I was wondering if there's any obvious explanation for that. Yeah, I don't remember the number of objects that went into this uh, chart, but um, I think basically we don't know quite yet. But one thing we plan on doing with New Horizons, and also that's going to be really enabled when we have LSST, is to discover more small, more Trojans at smaller sizes. And so uh, we're hoping to do some investigation of targets that are at a distance where we're not doing a close-up flyby. So hoping to characterize more of the population than just the six targets that we're talking about. But I don't have a good answer for why there's no peas in the middle class. Yeah. We go to the home <coughs> chance. Um, I noticed in the video of Patroclus, I think, is that yeah. how you pronounce it? Yeah, Patroclus. They were casting shadows on each other, but I thought they were inclined. Um, is that just artistic? Yeah, that, I think that's artistic <coughs> license. <license. coughs> yeah. Yeah, that, I don't like that. <laughs> Last question. So uh, where does your trajectory take you after you fly past these? Yes, uh, that's a good question. So our trajectory actually takes us um, back towards the Earth, and we just keep looping around. And so we can continue making observations of Trojan asteroids in extended mission. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the person that could ask this question needs to be sufficiently young. Yes. Uh, so we all look forward to our colloquium later today. Thank you. All right. Do I have a pointing pointing device? Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Jillian Bellaberry from CUNY at Queensborough Community College, also a research scientist at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, I'm happy to talk about this cool side project I've had a lot of fun thinking about, migrating black holes and AGN disks as gravitational wave sources. So the main motivation for this comes from LIGO, which has now observed 10-ish black hole, black hole mergers. And for the most part, many of these are more massive than we expected and also have misaligned spins. So these are all more massive than black holes that we have seen through other methods like in X-ray binaries. And so that has challenged stellar evolution theories to come up with how do you get two massive black holes that are this big in the first place, how do you make them that big? How do you get them in a binary? How do you get the binary to merge? Apparently, this happens pretty often. So a lot of that is challenging our stellar evolution theories. And so we thought, well, maybe we need a new theory that isn't based on stellar evolution, but based on some other type of environment. So I'm going to divert for a second and talk about planets. I promise this is relevant. Um, but the, I, the idea for this black hole idea actually comes from a planetary formation model. So the idea is you have your star and you have your protoplanetary disk. There are protoplanets in the disk, and because they feel uh, hydrodynamic torques from the disk, they migrate either inwards or outwards, depending on the direction of the torques. And one idea is that there are some sort of sweet spots where the torques actually balance out. So you've got your outward torque and your inward torque, and they're going to cancel out at particular radii, which are called migration traps. So the idea is that mass can build up at those migration traps, and that really helps in planet formation because there are some troubles in planet formation where you need to form your planets really quickly before your uh, protoplanetary disk gets blown away by the radiation from the star. And so if you have a way to speed that up, that is helpful. So this is the kind of background idea 
that we're going with here. And those of you who work on planets may be familiar with this. But back to black holes and migration traps. The idea to apply this to black holes is basically to scale this all up by a factor of a million. And instead of a star, you have a supermassive black hole. And instead of a protoplanetary disk, you have an AGN disk. And so your migrating objects are not protoplanets, but instead they are stellar mass black holes or other compact objects like neutron stars or even stars. But objects that can be in the disk and can possibly feel these migratory torques from the AGN disk. If this were to happen, you would possibly get a lot of black hole mergers because you would have these migration traps in the AGN disk. You'd have black holes piling up in these migration traps because they're all orbiting. They might have low relative velocities, and so getting them to merge might be facilitated. And so you could build up bigger and bigger black holes, even possibly explaining the LIGO black holes, possibly even building up as large as an intermediate mass black hole, like a hundred or a thousand solar mass black hole, because these black holes could also accrete from the disk, and so they could gain mass by gas accretion as well as by merging with each other. Isn't this a cool idea? Such a cool idea. So we thought, well, are there going to be migration traps in AGN disks? That's a big if. Um, so something that uh, I did with some collaborators is took a, just a steady state analytic one-dimensional model of an accretion disk. Um, there's a couple in the literature. We used one from Circo and Goodman, 2003, and Thompson, Quadrat, and Murray, 2005, and just said, all right, if you calculate uh, based on the surface density profiles, the temperature profiles, the opacity, and some such, calculate the torques that objects will feel in the disk, will there be migration traps? So a quick little primer, this is not, this is fake, but a quick primer, if you have a graph of torque versus radius, what you're looking for in a migration trap is if the torque crosses the zero line in a downward direction. So that's when you have positive torque pushing out, negative torque pushing in. This is what we're looking for if we're trying to look for a migration trap. So I applied um, to this uh, idea to the Thompson, or no, to the Circo and Goodman model. And this is what the torque profile looks like, which is very weird, and you should ignore this thing here because it isn't actually important. But in this area here, there's actually, if there's a zoom in, there's a couple different crossings of the uh, zero line, which actually do correspond to migration traps. So this is on a linear scale, and I've also plotted it on a log scale where I take the absolute value of the torque. And so in that case, the positive torques are red and the negative torques are black, and these spots here are where it crosses the zero line. And so these are the there are two migration traps in this very basic analytic steady state, who knows how realistic it is model of an AGN disk. I totally acknowledge that the AGN disks are very complicated animals and that representing one in a 1D analytic steady state way is already not a great idea, but this is the beginning and we're moving forward from here. Um, so according to uh, this calculation, uh, there are two migration traps at, in terms of the gravitational radius for a 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole. There's one at about 25 and about 300 RG within the disk. So cool, maybe there's some, some promise to this. Um, so one of our next steps was to apply this to an n-body model. And so something that we did was we took this one-dimensional disk model and input the torques from the model, but not any hydrodynamics. So not actually putting in a live disk or anything like that, just this 1D torques from this model in a system with 10 different orbiting bodies and so see what they would do. So here is that result. Uh, here are 10 different orbiters that all start with 10 solar masses each at different radii. The migration trap is here. And you can see that after 200,000 years in this case, uh, we end up with only three objects because a bunch of them merge together. Again, merge, merging here is just they get close together and they're allowed to merge. There's no gravitational recoil, and so that's we're, we're ignoring that for now. Um, but we do end up with one pretty massive one here, 70 solar masses at the migration trap. And then there are a couple others that don't reach the migration trap, but they're in resonant orbits with that, that uh, primary migrator there. Um, and so this, this is on archive. I didn't put the number here, but um, it's actually being resubmitted today after referee comments. 
And so uh, there's a bunch of other examples that have been put up um, at different masses and starting them at different radii and whatnot, trying to see w whether the migrators uh, go to the migration traps, whether they merge, whether you can build up black holes in this way. Uh, another thing that we're working on that I don't have any figures of yet is a more hydrodynamic model of this. So we're doing some, um, right now, 2D disk simulations where we're putting migrators in the disks, but we're trying to add more, um, more physics based to, f uh, to figure out how accurate the torque calculations are. Because um, it assumes that all the, re the retrograde, uh, or all the, all the orbiters are prograde, um, and we want to see if retrograde orbiters change things. Also, there's no um, calculation of uh, feedback from accretion of the stellar mass black holes onto the disk and how that extra source of disk heating will change the way things go. Um, there's a whole bunch of physics here that hasn't been included yet, but we're sort of trying to include it step by step just to um, work out this neat idea and see if it is a really a good way to explain some of the LIGO black holes. So the implications for gravitational waves. Um, so if this is a channel, whether it's a primary channel or a secondary channel, who knows how common this is, but if it is a channel for black hole mergers, uh, it can explain a lot of the extra large masses that LIGO has seen. This could also be a LISA source. LISA is a space-based gravitational wave observatory that will launch in the 2030s. Uh, and it can observe things like intermediate mass black holes merging with supermassive black holes. So if this runaway disk growth creates something that's about 100 or 1,000 solar masses, and that eventually merges with the supermassive black hole, then that would also create a different type of gravitational wave signal called an EMRI, uh, extreme mass ratio in spiral. Um, in terms of detecting this sort of thing electromagnetically, it's tough because it's in an AGN, and AGN are bright in all of the wavelengths, pretty much. And so trying to detect something that's going on next to an AGN is very challenging. Um, but whenever there are gravitational wave events, something we could do is rather than uh, target vast areas of sky and look at all of the galaxies, if we only target the AGN in the sky in the error circle, we could possibly, uh, we could definitely cut down the sample size of what we're looking for by a lot and maybe try and see some sort of time varying signal, possibly in the x-rays, possibly in some other thing. I'm definitely open to hearing about ideas about how to detect this sort of phenomenon when it's happening next to an AGN because we need all the ideas that we can get. My alarm hasn't gone on yet, and so I'm, but I, oh, all right then. <laughs> the end, thank you very much. Perfect timing. Uh, just a quick question before we ask. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of other there are lots of other objects in addition to black holes that would be trapped. There are all kinds of crap, like stars and... Yeah, all kinds of crap. So uh, why, would, why would the black holes be the predominant merger? Ah, so the, that the migration time scale is proportional to the mass of the migrating object. And so the heavier it gets, the faster it moves. And so stars will also definitely migrate, but not as quickly. And so in terms of building up in migration traps, the more, more massive objects will get there first. Okay. Um, well, this is really fascinating, very cool. Um, I, I don't know if Dan is thinking the same thing that I am. I think so. <laughs> we, we, we've both been working on lensing in double AGN and also in double black holes, but we have not yet considered you know, lensing in the AGN stellar mass black hole regime because we weren't thinking about that regime. And so, I'm, and in fact, in the in the in both cases, particularly in the AGN AGN regime, um, you know, you really do get a very significant, potentially detectable signature that you have these two black holes rather than mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. in, in the AGN. I'm not sure because we'd have to do the calculations, but that may be one way for you to get at the issue of whether you can tell that these things exist. Now, the calculations have to be done offhand. It seems promising, but you know, okay. we really have to look at it. Great. So the EM and the gravitational waves could be like this, but it's a different, it's a different size. Ooh. So. That's right. All right. Thanks for that idea. Uh, <laughs> would the torques that would cause the uh, change of orbital angular momentum of these black holes in AGN also 
affect the spin angular momentum of these black holes? And would that be uh, uh, one of the major differences between the uh, protoplanetary disk and planet migration case versus this very different scales of, of, uh, of different types of angular momentum? Yeah, um, I think the, the, main, the main source of angular momentum for the black hole spin is probably from accreting gas, but also there's, um, the spins could also be reversed depending on if the, depending on whether the binary is retrograde or prograde to the, to the disk, you would end up getting, your, your remnant will end up actually getting sort of a variety of spins. And so we have a spin paper coming out pretty soon actually trying to, but I haven't read it yet. Um, it is not at that point because I'm not the main author. But um, trying to see if we can reproduce the low spin distribution of the LIGO mergers. Um, and I think we can, but I think it depends on a number of the binaries being retrograde compared to the disk rotation, which it's, it's unclear how that will go. And that's, I think, the follow-up to Amy Secunda's paper here is something she's figuring out on how the binaries uh, began before they merged and see how, what their orientations are. There was one report in on Astro PH just last night uh, of a high spin event, but uh, low significance. It's not clear. Oh, so there can be a high spin one? Yes, there can Maybe. be, but, but it's not from the LIGO team, it's uh, coming from the prison team. Oh, okay, but with the LIGO data? Yes, Ooh. the public O1 data. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So my question is related to Avi. Um, uh, in proprietary disks, you can see the gas and dust radially segregated in a fashion that's thought to um, be a consequence of the migratory traps, even if you can't see the planets themselves. <coughs> is there any prospect for seeing evidence of like, large-scale segregation of material in the migratory traps, even if you can't see the uh, gravitational resources themselves? I don't think so because the accretion disks are on a very, um, very small scale, and they're far, I mean, they're, they're sort of the same scale as a protoplanetary disk, they're the same size, but they're way further away. And so um, that com combined with their brightness, I think, I don't think anybody's been able to radially resolve features. No, but it at least, at least, uh, at least light this curve, close. perhaps. That's an interesting thing to examine, because yeah. there would be time for a period to do. Okay. Yeah, so maybe time variability. Yeah, because this, they're at, uh, they're at the, uh, you know, 300 RG or so, it's quite close to the supermassive black hole. If something was further in the outskirts, one could think about it, but this is pretty close to the, to the, to the trap is. Yes. Uh, so also following up on Avi's thing, uh, the stars being in the disk, <coughs> while their migration timescales should be long, they be, should be, they shouldn't migrate themselves, but they'll be swept up by these black holes and resonances, and so maybe black holes could push them into other black holes. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, would black hole star mergers be an EM counterpart uh, that would be detectable, or is that also suffering sort of from the same issue? Ooh, it could be if there was sort of like a a gamma ray burst. Yeah, <laughs> a gamma ray. Wow. Yeah, I think I think that opens a whole other possibility. Something like a, or something like a, even a, if there's an intermediate mass black hole, if there's like a total disruption event or something, like that, you'd be able to see um, on top of the AGM. That is something we're thinking. So you have some more projects to do. All right. <laughs> uh, but very productive morning for me. So we'll, we'll stop the questions now so that you have time to work on this. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.